welcome to the second part of this week in Tudor history. Now, firstly, I'm going to take you back to the 25th of March, 1584, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, when letters patent were granted to Walter Raleigh, giving him free liberty and license to discover, search for, find out and view lands, countries and territories for the benefit of himself, his heirs and assigns forever. It went on to describe these territories, such remote heathen and barbarous lands, countries and territories not actually possessed of any Christian prince and inhabited by Christian people. And as Nancy Bradley Warren points out in her book, Women of God and Arms, Elizabeth I and her government were not only granting Raleigh the right to colonise lands owned by the indigenous people, they were also giving him the right to take lands held by Spain, as they didn't view the Spanish Catholics as true Christians. Raleigh's expedition, which comprised four ships and two pinnaces, under the command of his cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, set out in 1585. Grenville dropped off a party of men on the island of Roanoke, leaving Ralph Lane in charge of the colony before he went off privateering. Sadly, the colony failed due to lack of provisions and Lane abandoned it in 1586 and returned to England with Francis Drake, who landed there on his way back to England from the Caribbean. The following year, Raleigh decided to try again at establishing a colony there, sending an expedition which included families under the leadership of John White. In August 1597, just days after the arrival of these new colonists, John White's granddaughter, Virginia Dare, was born on the island, becoming the first child born to English settlers in the New World. Unfortunately, the colony failed again. I'll give you a link to my video on it. It became known as the Lost Colony. But Governor John White returned to England for supplies at the end of 1587. And when he went back to the island in August 1590, the 115 people he'd left behind had completely disappeared. By the way, although Raleigh organised these expeditions, he never actually went to Virginia. I'll give you a link to my video on Raleigh's life, career and downfall. He ended up being executed in King James I's reign. And moving on to the 26th of March. On the 26th of March 1566, also in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Edmund Grindle, Bishop of London, summoned 110 ministers to Lambeth Palace to get them to pledge their willingness to wear vestments, as modelled by the man in front of them, Robert Cole, a former non-conformist who now complied. The outfit consisted of a square cap, gown, tippet and surplice, they were also asked to inviolably observe the rubric of the Book of Common Prayer and the Queen's Majesty's injunctions and the Book of Convocation and to commit to these orders on the spot by writing volo or no volo. 37 ministers refused and were suspended. This sparked off a pamphlet war between Parker and nonconformists like Robert Crowley, vicar of St. Giles without Cripplegate, who published a brief discourse against the outward apparel of the Popish Church. Crowley saw vestments as evil, quoting Psalm 31, I have hated all those that hold of superstitious vanities on the title page, and viewing their use as encouraging papists. In response, Archbishop Parker, in his work, A Brief Examination for the Time of a Certain Declaration, lately put in print in the name and defence of certain ministers in London refusing to wear the apparel prescribed by the laws and orders of the realm, great title, accused Crowley of challenging royal supremacy and of leading the laity astray by disobeying the laws of the land. 
There were further battles, with nonconformists seeing vestments as an abuse, but others, like Parker, seeing their use as important and part of the church's duty. Crowley ended up being deprived of his parish in June 1566, along with other nonconformists. There wasn't just a pamphlet war between these churchmen. There were also protests of women in London in support of the nonconformists. And women like Anne Locke, a good friend of reformer John Knox, and Catherine Bertie, Duchess of Suffolk, supported them and acted as patron to these nonconformist ministers. Vestments weren't the only issue for these nonconformists. The root of their unhappiness was the failure of their petition to have the 1559 Book of Common Prayer revised. They were unhappy with Archbishop Parker prescribing that the book should be conformed to in every aspect. So, pamphlet wars and protests. Now, moving on to the 27th of March, and this time in King Henry VIII's reign. On the 27th of March 1539, George Talbot, 4th Earl of Shrewsbury, was laid to rest at St Peter's Church in Sheffield. Talbot is known for his loyalty to the King during the Pilgrimage of Grace uprisings, which was seen as crucial to the failure of the rebellion. But let me tell you a bit more about this Tudor Earl. George Talbot, 4th Earl of Shrewsbury, was born in Shifnal in Shropshire in 1468, and he was the son and heir of John Talbot, 3rd Earl of Shrewsbury, and his wife Catherine Stafford. His father died in 1473, and Talbot was just five, so the wardship of the young new Earl of Shrewsbury was granted to William Baron Hastings, who arranged the marriage of Talbot to his daughter Anne. They went on to have around 11 children, but sadly only one surviving son, Francis, who became the fifth Earl of Shrewsbury. Oh, and three surviving daughters, Margaret, who married Henry Clifford, Earl of Cumberland, Mary, who had an unhappy marriage with Anne Boleyn's former sweetheart, Henry Percy, sixth Earl of Northumberland, and Elizabeth, who married William, third Baron Dacre of Gilsland. In 1487, Talbot served King Henry VII at the Battle of Stoke Field, known as the Last Battle of the Wars of the Roses, and he was made a Knight of the Garter. He also served the King in the French Campaign of 1492. In 1502, he was made Lord Steward of the Household. Then, following the accession of the young King Henry VIII, Talbot was made Chamberlain of the Exchequer, and was also sent on several diplomatic missions. The French kings Louis XII and King Francis I granted him pensions. In 1512, following the death of his first wife, Talbot married Elizabeth Walden, daughter of Sir Richard Walden of Erith in Kent. They had a daughter together named Anne, who married Peter Compton, son of Henry VIII's groom of the stool, William Compton, and then afterwards she married William Herbert, 1st Earl of Pembroke. Talbot served as Lieutenant of the Vanguard in the 1513 French Campaign and Lieutenant General in 1522 in the Scottish Borders and again in 1532. In October 1536, when the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion broke out in Lincolnshire, in just one week Talbot was able to raise well over 3,000 men on horseback to help put down the rebellion. The threat of his force was a factor in the rebels of Lincoln disbanding after hearing a royal proclamation. When further rebellion broke out in Yorkshire, Talbot and his men marched north to prevent Doncaster from being captured by the rebels. Talbot joined up with Norfolk, but they were outnumbered by the rebels and so had to negotiate. However, as historian G.W. Bernard notes, Shrewsbury's actions halted the momentum of the rising and prevented them marching south because of his influence spreading from Sheffield down through Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. Bernard goes as far to say that it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that in October 1536, the fate of King Henry VIII lay in the hands of the fourth Earl of Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury was a conservative Catholic and he was not a supporter of Anne Boleyn. 
His son Francis attended her coronation in place of him. His rewards in Henry VIII's reign included the stewardship of Tutbury and lands in Staffordshire and Derbyshire that were part of the Duchy of Lancaster estates. He also owned Sheffield Manor, one of the places that Cardinal Wolsey stayed at when he was travelling to London in 1530 to answer charges of treason. Talbot the Earl of Shrewsbury died on the 26th of July 1538 at Wingfield. But he wasn't buried until the 27th of March 1539 when he was laid to rest in the Shrewsbury Chapel of St Peter's Church in Sheffield, which is now the cathedral. I couldn't find a reason why it took so long to bury him. And finally, the 28th of March. On the 28th of March 1555, Protestant Stephen Knight and Protestant William Piggott were burnt at the stake for heresy in Essex at Malden and Braintree, respectively. In his Book of Martyrs, martyrologist John Fox writes of how Stephen Knight and William Piggott were first examined regarding their views on the Eucharist, to which they answered that the body and blood of Christ were only in heaven and nowhere else. After being examined regarding other beliefs, according to Fox, they were exhorted to recant and revoke their doctrine and receive the faith. But they refused, and when Bishop Bonner realised that neither his fair flatterings nor yet his cruel threatenings would prevail, he condemned them for heresy. Both men were handed over to the sheriffs of London and imprisoned at Newgate until they were taken to Essex for their executions. Fox records, The 28th day of March, the said William Piggott was burnt at Braintree, and Stephen Knight at Malden, who at the stake, kneeling upon the ground, said this prayer, which here followeth. O Lord Jesus Christ, for whose love I leave willingly this life, and desire rather the bitter death of thy cross, with the loss of all earthly things, than to abide the blasphemy of thy most holy name, or to obey men in breaking thy holy commandment. Thou seest, O Lord, that whereas I might live in worldly wealth to worship a false god and honour thine enemy, I choose rather the torment of the body and the loss of this my life, and have counted all things but vile dust and dung that I might win thee, which death is dearer unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Such love, O Lord, hast thou laid up in my breast that I hunger for thee, as the deer that is wounded desireth the soil. Send thy holy comforter, O Lord, to aid, comfort and strengthen this weak piece of earth, which is empty of all strength of itself. Thou rememberest, O Lord, that I am but dust, and able to do nothing that is good. Therefore, O Lord, as of thine accustomed goodness and love, thou hast bidden me to this banquet, and accounted me worthy to drink of thine own cup amongst thine elect. Even so, give me strength, O Lord, against this thine element, which, as to my sight, it is most irksome and terrible. So to my mind, it may, at thy commandment, as an obedient servant, be sweet and pleasant, that through the strength of thy Holy Spirit, I may pass through the rage of this fire into thy bosom according to thy promise, and for this mortal receive an immortal, and for this corruptible put on incorruption. Accept this burnt sacrifice, and offering, O Lord, not for the sacrifice, but for thy dear son's sake, my Saviour, for whose testimony I offer this free will offering with all my heart and with all my soul. O Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins as I forgive all the world, O sweet Son of God, my Saviour, spread thy wings over me. O blessed and holy Ghost, through whose merciful inspiration I am come hither, conduct me into everlasting life. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. On the very same day, Protestant William Diggle was burnt at the stake for heresy. Of Diggle, Fox simply records, 
About this time suffered William Dibble, most constantly offering his body a burnt sacrifice unto God, forsaking the world, life and all for the love of his holy truth. Although, as Susan Doran and Thomas Freeman point out in Mary Tudor Old and New Perspectives, in his 1563 book, Fox states that Diggle was burnt in Banbury, Oxfordshire. In a previous edition, he stated Danbury in Essex, which is backed up by John Knox and the Crowley Chronicle. Wherever he was burnt, he died for his Protestant faith. Well, I'm sorry to leave you on such a sad note with burnings at the stake, but that's it for this week in Tudor History. Thank you for joining me. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking round about there, and I promise it's not all horrible burnings. You can give me a like and leave me a comment and you can hit the bell to be notified as videos go live. I do appreciate you watching. Take care, see you soon, bye bye. <laughs> oh.